Welcome to Board Games and I'm the podcast of board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. Hey, this is Anthony. And this is episode 278, BGG Upcoming Convention Releases. We'd like to thank all of our Patreon backers for helping us bring you a brand new episode, but especially Lyle. Thanks for joining the team. You rock, man. All right, Anthony, we are back with a brand new episode. Obviously, there's been so much going on in the board gaming industry, but in particular is how the board gaming industry is dealing with all the changes these days and especially how to manage their upcoming releases. There's so many games in the queue that haven't hit the table or even haven't hit the market yet, and there is not a lot of information out there. So for this episode, for our feature review, We'll be talking about all the upcoming releases from June 1st to August 31st. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a mess. And <laughs> like, it, admittedly, you look at the list on Board Game Geek and they're just like, I don't know. We sent a survey out. We'll see what happens. <laughs> like, normally this time of year, you have the Origins preview and then you have the Gen Con preview. And the Gen Con preview is like the big one, right? Yes. Before Essen. And it has, you know, 800 games on it or whatever. This year, I think we have like 50 or 60 some odd games on this list, and we don't even know when they're exactly dropping because nobody, you know, everything was closed in China for months, and then everything was closed here for months, and Mm -hmm. some companies held back their releases, others are going to deluge them onto the market. It's it's a whole big old mess, as even more than board game releases normally are. So I think we're going to have an interesting summer trying to figure out when things are coming out and what is the hotness uh, for 2020. But it'll be fun. I feel like we might just have a few games that pop up out of nowhere that would have been big discussed releases. And now that it's like, oh, wow, that's really good. And I didn't even know that was coming out. So I'm kind of excited for that because we don't get surprised very often anymore. It's going to be one of those like Beyonce drops a secret track, you know, in the middle of the summer. Yeah. So <laughs> like, hey, here's this awesome game that you never thought you'd reprint. Bam. And everyone's like, oh, my God. So Hopefully, we will be able to cover a lot of those upcoming releases and maybe speculate on a couple of more that will be hitting, hopefully, the market this coming summer. But before we go into all of that fun stuff, Anthony, we have a lot that's going on with our listeners. So what's our question of the week? All right. Question of the week this week, courtesy of a uh, graphic that you sent me a few days ago. And I can't source it because I have no idea where it came from. But it was a list of like 30 questions to answer about board games and your hobby. It was like a 30-day challenge, I think they called yep. it. So I, I pulled a few questions from here that I liked. Not all of them, and some of them we've already done, but a few that I liked. And the first one on the list was the most obvious to start with. What board game drew you into the hobby? And this one in particular got a ton of responses because everyone has an answer for it, right? Everybody has like the game or games that got them into board gaming. I think we had 50 or 60 responses between Facebook and Twitter. So obviously I'm not going to read them all. Just kind of give you some highlights. Going through the list, of course, we have all of the staples that you expect to see. We have Catan is a lot of people's first modern hobby board game, Ticket to Ride. Different variants of that, but it pops up a lot on the list as a game people started with. Machi Koro, Sushi Go, Dominion, Carcassonne, like all the gateway games you expect to see on the list. A few people, though, started a little bit heavier. So Scott mentions Power Grid as his first hobby board game, which is, you know, not super light. It's a lot of math in that one. We had John mentioned Advanced Civilization, which is a whole big thing to jump into as your first hobby board game. And again, these aren't necessarily people's first hobby board games. These are the ones that got them into the hobby. But at the same time, it's just, you know, it's, it's a big beast of a game. Betrayal at House on the Hill actually popped up a few times on the list. I know a lot of people get in from the more thematic side of things, and, and that one's definitely very popular for that. One that showed up a lot on here that I was surprised by, I guess, but I don't know why I was surprised, is Risk. Four mm. different people mentioned Risk, and a couple other people mentioned, like, Risk 2210 or Risk Legacy as a game that got them into gaming in general. I liked Risk as a kid, but I don't know if it was a game that got me into gaming for me, it was Stratego. Loved Stratego. And then, of all things, Scrabble. Like, those are the <laughs> kinds of games I had in my head when I went to the board game group where you and I met the first time. Because I was just like, yeah. these are what I know about board games. I didn't really know anything about modern hobby board games, except like Catan I'd played a couple times. So it's it's kind of a funny uh, mix of directions people come from. And for me, it's definitely more the old school stuff. And then once I discovered hobby games, I'm like, all of it. I like all of it. We're good. 
no one of these games is dragging me in. I'm just, I'm all in. Let's do it. Yeah, it's kind of hard to pick where it all began, right? Obviously, we all have our early childhood kind of stuff. Risk was big for me, too. I played Risk a lot in college and had a group of friends that were really, really into it. I probably already told this story where I had a friend who would just literally stand on his chair and throw the dice down at the table, thinking that somehow that would give him a little more force into the game. So there's a part of that. I guess Munchkin was one of those things where it was, you know, going to meetup groups and one of the kind of social kind of fun games that people could play and laugh about was Munchkin. Plays a ton of people, not really well, but it plays a ton of people and people got a good laugh out of it. And that kind of opened me up to like the infinite number of expansions that come with hobby board gaming, which up to that point, I never knew. <laughs> and I guess, you know, the the kind of big game that really solidified it for me was probably Seven Wonders, because again, it was one of those situations where a civilization game on the table that was playable by so many people, and it just it the artwork was at an, an extra level, the game components was at an extra level, and then the gameplay was at an extra level because it was card drafting and tableau building. So I guess those would probably be the three spots that I would I would point to as far as like getting into the hobby and then still to this day never getting out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I feel like maybe Ticket to Ride. I feel like that was the first one I kind of experienced when it came to the sure. game group. But I don't know. There wasn't like a one game that jumped out at me. It's funny. I was just like, I'll play anything. I'll play all of these. I'm up for whatever. And it just kind of grew from there. Gotcha. Okay. So that's what's going on with our listeners. As Anthony mentioned, we have so many more of you out there. Please jump onto our social media challenge and see our Facebook stuff. See Twitter, BoardGamersAnonymous.com, our guild on Board Game Geek, our Patreon account that has brand new episodes posted there that you can learn more about our collections, more about our reviews of previous episodes, and obviously helping us connect you more into the hobby. So please check us out. Please remark. Please post there. We'd love to hear from you. All right, Anthony. So that's what's going on with our listeners. Let's get on to the games that we want to hit the table. Let's talk about our acquisition disorders. Acquisition disorders. Yes. So as I talked about at the beginning of the show, there's not a lot of new stuff coming out right now. and We don't know when it's coming out. So you've noticed that because our, all of our acquisition disorders in recent months have been Kickstarters. And actually right now we're in a bit of a lull on Kickstarter. That's not to say I'm not interested in this game. It's just... I had to dig a little bit. Carl Chuddick has a new game up on uh, Kickstarter. It is a trick-taking game called Crash with some truly questionable artwork. Um, it's just some weird, ugly-looking people on these cards. But the game sounds interesting. Uh, very simple rules, of course, like any trick-taking game. Just running through real quick, like what you're supposed to do here, you have a hand of eight cards. One person's going to play a card to the center of the table and then choose someone else to play a card to the trick. You don't necessarily go in clockwise order. You choose somebody. The person who just got named has to play a card that's equal or higher with the same icon. And you continue with that, choosing somebody and then tell somebody can't do it. And they say a crash it ends the hand, right? You That person then places all their cards face up in front of them. And the last person to play a card to the trick wins the trick. And they're going to take all the cards as a pile, the last card on top, and leave that out in front of them, and he'll lead and start off the next way. The round will end when, at the end of a trick, any one player has three or more tricks in front of them, or one person has run out of cards, and then you do the scoring. So pretty standard trick-taking fair, except for the part where you pick who goes after you, which sounds like you could like gang up on somebody, which of course you can. <laughs> I think that's the point of it. But at the same time, you don't always know what everybody's hands are. So you could gang up on somebody and they could still smoke you. You got to be careful, right? So it's an interesting mechanic that I don't know that I've seen before. I'm sure other games have done it, but I personally haven't seen it. And so, yeah, I'm uh, interested in checking it out. Carl Chuddick has a great gameography. Like he's done a lot of really amazing games over the years. And this one is not necessarily like those. So that's why it's interesting to me. And, uh, you know, my resurgence of late into trick-taking type games makes it something I want to check out. So anyways, that is Crash. It's on Kickstarter right now. It's up for about another week or so when you hear this. And it's not quite to its goal, but it's getting there. So it should be fun by the time you hear this. You know, if people listen back to our earliest episodes, they would have never imagined that here you would be 
having an acquisition disorder for a trick taking game. Yeah, because the ones that came out back then suck. <laughs> I still hate those games. It's not like I'm like, oh, all of a sudden I like uh, cheaty mages. Like, no, it's still a bad game. It's not. Cheaty mages uh, is a fine game. It's fine. I, it's bad. It's a bad game. <laughs> it's not really. not trick taking either, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what game I'm thinking of. It was like You're all those a different game. Like, You're not thinking of cheaty yeah. mages. I know what game you hate. You hate a uh, Chronicle. Same designer. Yes. That's what I'm thinking of. Yes, Sage cannot, uh, right? Sage cannot. Yeah, that's yeah. a bad game. I mean, I also didn't like PD <laughs> Major, but yeah, that was a bad game. I remember I played that game with you, so I was with you as you just like twisted and turned and boiled and bubbled over with <laughs> hatred for that game. Hey, Anthony, you don't get to do anything this round. <laughs> Right? Ooh, sweet. This is fun. Yeah. No, I, like the first five or six trick-taking games I played, I didn't like any of them. And then we played Poison, and I was like, this is okay. And then and then we finally played Diamonds. I'm like, I like this game. This game is good. But that it took so long to get to that point. And by then, I was just like, I don't, I'm out. They're all bad. It turns so out they're not all bad. So it's great. So are you saying that Poison was the antidote for bad trick-taking games? Uh, <laughs> but I'm bumped. There you go. For that bad joke. I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, let me talk about a game that I am hotly anticipating based on a game system, game mechanic, that I've loved the entire time, Anthony. This is Freedom 5, a Sentinels comic book board game. Now, so let me talk first about mechanics, because this is going to matter a lot. Freedom 5, a Sentinels comic board game, which, again, a little too bit long in the tooth as far as the title is concerned, is based on my favorite game of all time, Defenders of the Realm. Now, if you haven't played that, or if you haven't played the, I guess, the remake, the reskin with the kind of like post-apocalyptic kind of monsters and such like that, the game is all about utilizing the pandemic mechanism, but allowing you to have asymmetrical player powers and abilities and actually to be able to grow your individual character and to be able to do things individually. So it's everything you love about Pandemic and everything you don't love about Pandemic. I don't think Jason's listening, so I think we're okay to say that. Nonetheless, so it's utilizing that great mechanic. Probably many of you haven't played the board game before, but now it's getting reskinned and I guess redeveloped somewhat in a Freedom 5, or as we all know it, if you haven't played the actual card game, or I guess board game, card game, tabletop game, Sentinels of the Multiverse. So Sentinels Sentinels of the Multiverse is its own comic book universe of characters, heroes, villains, environments. It's huge. It has a ton of expansions. It does have comic books, which is what is being drawn from here. It had a tactical game at one point. It has online game playing for it. You know, Greater Than Games, who produced this, has done a wonderful job. I mean, I think you and I have talked a long time about this, Anthony, that we really, really appreciate it, especially back in the day. Talk about back in the day, so to speak. This was the best comic book superhero game out there at the time. But obviously now Marvel and DC has upped their game a bit, but this was the best thing at the time. So again, this is a co-op game, strategy game, for one to five heroes. And your job is to protect your home city and its inhabitants from the onslaught of villainy from Baron Blade. Now, if you know anything about Sentinels of the Multiverse, he was the original bad guy. There's been since a ton of other bad guys in here. And that's why I really am excited about this game, because Defenders of the Realm allowed for a ton of different characters. So being that the Sentinels of the Multiverse universe has so many superheroes, so many supervillains, it's pretty easy to swap out characters and villains and environments and things like that. So that's what's really exciting me the most because I love to have the diversity of gameplay at the table here. So you're going to master your own character's abilities. You're going to have special abilities with each particular character. There's going to be different crises about as you protect the city and you're going to work as a team and also separately to combat the bad guys. There isn't much more information out there yet about this, but it allows you an opportunity to play Sentinels in the Multiverse in a more, 
I would I would say thinning kind of you know version tabletop version. I mean the card game is great because it had a lot of that comic book art, but there were so many cards to the game and the quality was a bit low and the mechanics were a little bit fussy from here to here. But I think this is going to be perfect for it. And I think the opportunity and I think the fact that Defenders of the Realms AI that came into play here, the pandemic mechanic, will actually do really well here. So I'm really excited about this. Yeah, I mean, I saw this float by. I think I got a press release and I don't know. It seems interesting. I just I don't think anything in this universe has really ever captured my attention. You know, I played the mm-hmm. game a couple of times and just found it long and cumbersome, but I haven't really explored it much either, so I'd be up to try it. But it, yeah, I don't know if it's top of my list at the moment. All right, so that's all the games that we're looking to hit the table. Let's talk about the games that did hit the table and the tablet. Let's talk about her at the tables. What do you got, Anthony? All right, so this is a game that I backed on Kickstarter a ways back, and it actually showed up, I think, before the pandemic, but it's a little bit lighter of a game, so it's not something that was at like the top of my list to bring out you know, with my game group, is On the Underground, London, Berlin. So this is a uh, fairly light game. It's a re-implementation of On the Underground, um, which came out in 2006, and I believe was just the, uh, the London Underground. This one has a a map on the other side for Berlin with a few different mechanics as well. The game is fairly simple. Like I said, it's not overly complicated. There's only two actions you can take on your turn. One is to take um, one of these little tokens that you need two of to like branch off of a network. And the other is to lay a rail down. Um, The number of different rails that you control changes depending on uh, how many players you have. So if you play with two people, for example, there are four different lines that you'll control. If you play with all four players, I believe it's just two. So you're trying to get as many of those lines out as possible. What you do on your turn, of course, is you pick one of those lines and you'll get four actions and you place them out in whatever order you want to do. Once you've placed one on the board, you have to branch from that initial network. Of course, you can't just go wherever you want and hope that they connect in the end like Ticket to Ride. And the way you score points is by connecting to like these major stations on the map by getting to the end of the route and by connecting, to, I don't know, like destinations or something like the two parks or the two grocery stores or whatever they might be called. You do those things, you get like one, two or three points for doing that. You also get points if the passenger who runs at the end of everybody's turn uses any of your lines. So what you end up doing is Early on, it's very, very simple. You're just like putting stuff out, trying to score a couple points here and there. But later on, you're trying to like manipulate the course of the passenger. So he's going to use as many of your trains as possible and as few of your opponents as possible. So you like there's a lot more scoring options on the outside of the board, but you want to try to control the center as much as possible because the passenger is going to go back and forth across the center a lot. The way you choose where he goes depends on these cards you draw. So you're going to have express train routes and locals. If you have at least one express and one local card out in the tableau, there's four out there, he'll go to one of each based on what's closest. If you only have one, if they're all yellow cards, for example, it'll just go to one destination and that'll be the end of that. So the card draw does have a little bit of an impact on like if you draw the right cards, for example, and it happens to just be perfect routing, for you on your turn, you're like, oh, great. That's going to give me three points just based on the card I drew. But most of the time, especially early in the game, it's all about kind of manipulating and maneuvering where things are going to go based on what you want to try to accomplish. So it was a funny like playthrough where it took like 10 minutes to learn. I was surprised how relatively simple it was. And the first like half of the game, just like, okay, okay. <laughs> Laying tracks, laying tracks, laying tracks, two points, one point, two points, three points, one point. But the second half of the game got really interesting. I'd say the last few turns are pretty much on rails at that point because the whole board is pretty covered. But like that whole like middle third, second half of the game is really interesting in that you are constantly trying to manipulate and maneuver and adjust. And some of the tracks can have multiple lines go down them. Some of them can't, like you block them off like Ticket to Ride. So yeah, I was pleasantly surprised by this. I really quite enjoyed it. I feel like it's a good family white game at the front end of it. Just you're putting down tracks and trying to score points as long as you're scoring for the kids. And if you flip the board over and do the Berlin map, it's a little bit more complicated um, with different types of locations you can go and tokens you can take off the board to score points in different ways. But for the most part, it is 
I'd say like maybe the next step up from like a, a ticket to ride type of um, track lane game. It's it's not like a full blown train game, but it's not like a gateway game either. So it's I'm I'm pretty happy to have it. I'm glad I picked it up, and it is very colorful, like this big pastel panache just all over everything. So it's uh it's got a lot of color going for it, which is a big upgrade from the first edition if you take a look at those. So um, on the underground London Berlin. I give this a play. I'm happy to have it though. I'm glad I picked it up. It is a little bit lighter. It's I can't see every group gravitating towards it. And I do want to play a little bit more with the Berlin map. So it's not like suddenly my favorite game at this weight on my shelf, but I'm going to keep it. So I definitely like this one. On the Underground, London, Berlin. Yeah, I like the fact that this offers a different gameplay. As you mentioned, it's lighter, but it's not necessarily dumbed down. It actually is its own game. And as you mentioned, the artwork here, the color is something we don't typically see from our typical train games or your 18 double X kind of look. I know this was up on Kickstarter and it was something that I actually did consider picking up because again, when you think train games, you think boring kind of route building, very bland kind of situations, but this was, this seemed to be a little different. So I'm glad you picked this up and I hope you get a chance to play it soon. All right. So I'm going back to a game that I played, but I haven't talked about the expansion this game is Tokonoko. This is the game about pandas. So you probably have either played the game, hopefully at some point, where the panda and the gardener are moving around. And the idea here is to show off to the emperor how great you are with managing the panda and its sacred gardens. So there is a bunch of different actions that kind of play out in this game. And basically, as you're playing the game, the idea is to score points based on these objective cards. Uh, typically, the actions are based on placing tiles, moving the gardener, irrigating certain tiles, because you'll need to do that in order to reach the certain objectives, moving the panda. And when you do move the panda to a certain spot and there's bamboo present, which is really one of the nicest parts, you know, aesthetically of this game is actually there's like little wooden pieces that build up and they look like bamboo stalks in different colors. You're going to be able to have your panda eat one of those pieces of bamboo, goes in your belly and then you'll be able to score certain objective cards. As the game goes on, you'll be rolling dice, and based upon this weather die that you roll, you're going to be able to get a variety of different additional actions. So the sun lets you take an additional action, the rain lets you grow bamboo, the wind lets you take an action twice, the lightning allows you to move the pan on the board, and it just it gives a variety of different things that you can do in the game, which honestly tends to be a very samey type of game. So the die really adds a lot to uh, the gameplay. As you go on throughout the game, you'll be building up this garden. You'll be building up different bamboo. You'll be turning in these different objective cards. And then again, at the end of the game, whoever has the most points based on the objective cards wins. This has gotten a super mega release at one point. It was, I think, the first mega release that came out. I think it was like 300 and something dollars. It was this giant wood crate, giant panda, giant bamboo. The game aesthetically was so impressive that, you know, if you saw this at a game table, you would definitely want to come over. As I said, it's a good game, solid game. The problem with the game had been from time to time that eating the bamboo was such an easier objective to do, especially with the addition of the weather die, that building up the plots and then irrigating them were so troublesome. You almost had to get lucky in order for that to happen because the main pond tile that was in the middle that would irrigate other things based on the channels, it was kind of hard to come by to build in that particular region. So that was never really that great. Building up the bamboo stalks was also difficult. So the game kind of hindered itself in a lot of ways as far as some objectives were just easier than others. Some people got lucky as far as what card they drew. And then again, if you played the game before, you were just pulling the panda cards. I had done a like, you know, house rule where you just mix the deck together. This way, everyone had a variety and you couldn't really control necessarily what you were pulling from. But again, the game is supposed to be a light family weight game, a gateway entry game. The expansion that came out, the Chibi's expansion, was there to make the game a little bit better, right? To provide not just more of the same, but some different mechanics. So first off, it adds Miss Panda. So you have a female panda in the game. And Miss Panda acts 
mostly like the male panda in the game as far as moving around on the board. It does start on its own particular tile. So when a tile flips out with its symbol on it, that's where it's going to pop up. And again, because you are rolling the dice and you can move the panda around, you can choose which panda to move around. Now, the main part of the game, or <laughs> the name as, as so speaks, is you're going to be able to produce babies. Now, how do you produce a baby panda? Well, as everyone knows, of course, when the mommy panda is moved by the die or by your choice of action, then it enters into a hex that has the daddy panda. And then you give up a piece of bamboo of a certain color and you get a baby panda of that same color. And that baby panda tile, if you flip it over, gives you a bonus. And that bonus you have to use immediately. You can't save it for the rest of the game. So primarily what it's allowing you to do is have a more variety of different actions to take place and a way to get bonus to kind of speed the game up as well. There are also additional tiles in this game. In particular, there's a garden tile that will grow all three different types of bamboo. So that's going to help you meet your bamboo requirements. There are sacred hill tiles that if you irrigate those tiles, if you're able to uh, send the gardener over there to grow everything, then every tile of that sacred tile grows no matter where it is on the board. That was another situation where, as I said earlier, it's hard to get irrigation for all the tiles on the board. That kind of fixed some of that. There's a gardener's cabin tile that if you send the gardener up there, you'll be able to pick one of each of the bonus cards. And then based on what you want, you'll take one of those cards. So again, it gives you a variety of opportunities to look at the board and see what you want. There is a new irrigation tile, another another pond tile, the celestial pond tile that also pops up during the game and you'll have an opportunity to place that as well. So automatically by dropping that tile, you irrigate everything around it. So again, if you're building towards some of the plot situations, this helps you accomplish that. There's new objectives in the game. They're more or less helpful or not helpful, but they're just more objectives in the game which diversifies a lot of the gameplay in comparison to the original set. This new expansion makes Tokunoko better. It doesn't make it phenomenally better. It does obviously add another, you know, main gameplay element. It's nice to see a little female character, a little Pac-Man, Miss Pac-Man kind of situation there. It's nice to get the little bonuses in the game. It gives you something else to do and the variety of objectives you know, gives you a number of different ways to score and slows down at least a little bit that whole eating bamboo to score victory points things. So for the Chibi expansion, I'm going to give it a solid play. I thought it was a nice addition to the game. It doesn't fix everything. There are still some problems here and there with the game, but it's meant to be a gateway family game. Beautiful look at, really nice experience to have. And I will never play without the expansion if I ever play the base, base game gets a table. Yeah, I think I played this game once, the base game, mm -hmm. with you and Daniel. Like, <laughs> a long time ago. Like five, six years ago. So, I don't <laughs> know. I never got back to this. I've, I've played uh, Takedo dozens of times, but Takenoka sure. is not one I own, nor have I played more. So I couldn't even say uh, if I'd want or need the expansion because I can't remember the base game. <laughs> So, that's my input on that. I there don't remember go. it. <laughs> all right, so that's all the games that are hitting the table. Let's get on to our feature review. So for our feature review this week, we are looking at BGG's list of upcoming releases from June to August. So pretty much all the summer releases that hopefully, fingers crossed, will release. As Anthony said earlier, some have been delayed by many, many different reasons. And with Origins Online not going online, it's going to be a little more difficult to be able to know what's coming out, what to pick up at your local friendly game store, or what to pick up online. So we went online to find out what games are going to pop up there. So we're going to give you the kind of the inside take on these. All right. So first one up on the top of the list here, the most thumbs currently while we're recording this, is Uwe Rosenberg's New York Zoo. This one was already announced a while back. It's a Fjordland Spiel game, and uh, Capstone's publishing it here in the U.S. I don't remember if it was supposed to come out at Origins or Gen Con, but it was initially supposed to be a big convention release. And guess what it is? Guess what it is, Chris? It's it's Polyominoes. 
It is. It's puzzles. It's polyominoes. <laughs> Uwe Rosenberg seems to have completely given up on his worker placement games. I don't know what's going on anymore. <laughs> I think he's trying to send us a desperate message to help him out of whatever random prison cell he's in and he needs the right kind of combination of pieces to get him out of it. But yeah, so basically you're placing tiles in order to build these enclosures or you're adding animals. So it looks like we're looking at animeeples here, which is always great from Uwe Rosenberg's games. But, you know, not not a big fan of zoos in general, but I think this one's probably going to be a big hit. Oh, yeah. It's cute little animal meeples and puzzle oh, yeah. pieces. Yeah, it'll do well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next on the list here. I actually already have this game uh, because I uh, did the pre-order, but sure it is, yeah, you know it. <laughs> um, but it requires three to five players, and uh-huh. I don't think the kids are interested in a train game. So Ride the Rails mm-hmm. uh, is... It was number two in the Iron Rail series from Capstone. Mm-hmm. It is basically a series of old winsome games that they've redone the artwork for and updated, you know, mechanically a little bit with Ian O'Toole artwork. So the first one was Irish Gage, and now this one, Ride the Rails. Uh, I've played Irish Gage. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. This one I have not played yet, but it looks really good, and it's very, very pretty. Uh, there's also a map pack that gives you, like, two extra maps as well. So lots of good content, and it's not very expensive. Yeah, I don't want to be that guy, but honestly, it does look really good. And again, it's one of those situations where a lot of these games come off as very dry and very bland, but there's something really interesting and engaging about this game. So I'm looking forward to uh, getting this to the table. All right, next on the list is the newest from Isaac Vega, along with uh, Mr. Bistro and J. Arthur Ellis from Plat Hat Games, Forgotten Waters. This is another one that if you pre-ordered it, you may already have a copy because they shipped a bunch out to people who ordered back in March or April. But it is a big, meaty uh, three to seven players, but there is a one player and a two player variant for it. So anywhere from one to seven. Uh, I believe there's an app that goes along with it. And I believe it has like the big the storybook type of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Not exactly like the other games, but it does use some of the crossroads mechanics. So they're dipping into the well of the mechanics that they've developed for um, big heavy hitter games that they no longer have because sure. Plat Hat recently split off from Asmodee and Asmodee got to keep all the stuff that makes all the money. So <laughs> here's hoping this one does well for them because it looks really interesting. And it's, I almost pre-ordered it before I, cause I was like, it's three players though. I don't know when I'm going to play this. So maybe yeah. I'll wait, um, but it does look really good. Yeah. These storybook games are fascinating because there's so much interesting gameplay and the thematic narrative that allows you to run through is great. The artwork here is fantastic. The pieces are great. Plot Hat typically does a solid production and design. As you mentioned, the player count's a little iffy and you know, you're going back to that same kind of gameplay, at least the overall aesthetic that you've played before. But yeah, if this is your genre, jump on it. All right. Next one up on the list here is Fort. This is the newest game from Leader Games, and it's a little different than probably what you've seen out of Leader Games before. It is a small game. It's like, I think, $30 is what the MSRP is going to be. It is 20 to 40 minutes long, so it's relatively short as well. It is also a re-implementation of an older game, which, and this isn't like a bit of a whiplash in terms of theme here, but the original game, SPQF, was a, like, you're like Roman centurions or something and you're building up this ancient civilization and the artwork yeah. is very much that. And yeah. then this is you've got Kyle Farron's artwork who did all of Root's artwork mm-hmm. and you have a game about making friends and building forts and collecting toys. So yeah. the theme here is about as different as you could get and I'm all for it. I love when they do games like this and we were just trying to figure out if this is a kids game or not based on that. I don't know that it necessarily is but it looks fairly kid friendly. So I'm interested to see if this is something I can play with the kids. Does not matter. I am backing this. I don't care if it's a kid's game. It looks amazing. It seems fun. It obviously reminds me of being a kid and wanting to build up forts. And the actions that you take here are fun. You know, they're very kid based kind of situations. And I already have, I think, I think I'm going to tap out of Roman conquest and building games for the moment. I think I want something like Fort. At my table, leader games are fantastic. And what they've done up to this point is tremendous. They have my money. I don't even need to see the game. Just send it. Yep. Yeah, I'm with you, man. <laughs> Especially at that price. 
Yeah, that's, that's right. incredible. Yeah, it's fantastic. All right, next game on the list is High Rise. This is a new game from Formal Ferret Games, designer Gil Hova. Uh, his previous game that was a big hit was The Networks. And this one, similarly, was also um, funded on Kickstarter. It's coming out this summer. And it is a city building game, as you might expect by the name, with a few tweaks to it. So the goal of the game is to build buildings in the city. And you're going to score points by how big your buildings are and where they're located and how they're clustered together. But there's a corruption mechanic as well that allows you to lose victory points effectively, if you take too much, to take more powerful actions or get bonuses on your actions. So... I always kind of like that mechanic. I'm interested to see how it's implemented in this game because while I do always like the mechanic, it's not always done well. It needs to be really well balanced so you don't just shoot yourself in the foot repeatedly. But I love city building games. I love having like the tactile pieces on the board that kind of grow up over time. And I love the idea of kind of manipulating the victory points and taking the corruption to try to get the most out of the system. So (laughs) this is a game I'm actually interested in checking out. And it does have a solo mode, so... Even if we're still stuck in the house in a couple of months, I could still play it. Yeah, I've seen this game in prototype format in a lot of places over the last year. And it's had some different, different kind of ways that the buildings build up, as you mentioned, Anthony. And yeah, the final production here, at least what we're seeing online, looks quite good. And as you mentioned, the aesthetic of building the buildings up on a board is something that we've seen, you know, on a small level, but it's nice to see that it's really following its thematic roots. If this game is high rise to have a board with all these different high rises on the board, like tall, tall, you know, standees and such. Uh, yeah. All right. Next one on the list. Also a city building game. Uh, okay. <laughs> so apparently we got a theme this year. Yeah. This is Reiner Knizia's my city. So this was, uh, it's a spiel nominee actually. So it, a lot of people are keen to get their hands on this. And it has a legacy component to it. So Mm -hmm. there are 24 episodes to the game. And in each of them, you're going to be building up a city with polyaminos. No, no. (laughs) Uh, There's also a bingo mechanic in here in terms of like how you're building those out and uh, acquiring them and working within the, your grid of your city. But at the end of the day, you have these mechanics get added in throughout the game. It's not like a full legacy game. They are calling it a legacy game, but if you look through the rules, it's not like a big, massive legacy game where you're ripping stuff up and you can only play the game once. There's also alternate setup for repeatable play. So if you don't want to play the legacy version, you don't want to run through the episodes, you don't have to. Um, This one's getting a lot of buzz, obviously, with a Spiel nominee. It's from Cosmos. I just got the press release from them, I think yesterday or the day before, saying that it'll be out in July um, through Barnes & Noble. So Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can get this anywhere else right now, but you can pre-order it on the Barnes and Noble website and they're shipping it in mid July. All right. That's great. I love, I love their games and this is, and they're always at a fair price too. So yeah, looking forward to this. All right. Next one up is Stick'em. This is a really old game (laughs) that is getting published in the U S I believe for the first time. It's a very popular German uh, climbing game and it, I think it came out in like the early 90s. Yeah, 1993. Hmm. So this version of the game is from Capstone Games. And it is exactly what it sounds like. It's a trick-taking game in basically all sense of the word. But in this case, you have different colors, including a pain color. So they're like, there's cards you want, there's cards you don't want. And then kind of manipulate that in terms of what goes out and what doesn't go out. So it it definitely brings in a lot of the hand management stuff that I really like in trick taking games when you have to be very careful about what you play, when you play it, how you interact with other players. So I'm all for this. I definitely want to give it a go. Um, I know a couple of friends here locally have the German version or like their own print and play versions of the German version. Um, Haven't had a chance to play it yet, but I imagine I will at some point very soon. Yeah. It's interesting to see that capstone is bringing this out, but typically when they do bring games from overseas and reprint games they're pretty good games so yeah looking forward to this yeah all right next up is endangered from grand gamers guild uh this is a game about exactly what it sounds trying to help and save various endangered species which obviously (laughs) as a world right now we have a lot of issues with so it's just kind of cool to see this theme um in games especially when you have so many games are just not trying very hard thematically (laughs) They're either just the boring, blah, nothing fantasy theme or, hey, look, we're colonializing again or, hey, look, we're farming (laughs) again. So 
this is this is cool it's a cool yeah just different take on that no this is something very dynamic and it utilizes that whole idea of like each person has special abilities whether you're you know a environmental activist whether you're a lobbyist whether you know you're a lawyer out there or such or the idea is that you're spreading the message that these populations are tremendously endangered and here allows you to kind of play out those roles so yeah maybe it's not as you mentioned anthony it's, it's a different theme it's a necessary theme it's an educational theme and it's something that again lets you play out those mechanics by having special abilities which we all do in order to make a difference absolutely yeah it's fantastic all uh, right next one up on the list is uve rosenberg part two with uh fairy trails this is from paper plane games um which i don't think i've heard of before and it is a game for one or two players. And you're effectively just building out a little network path and then trying to put your houses down based on what you pass on the path. So mechanically, it looks incredibly simple, um, but it's also designed to be a very quick, accessible, like two-player game. So I know Rosenberg has a, a long history of a lot of two-player games. They're usually a little bit meatier than this, but... Mm -hmm. He know he seems to know what he's doing. Like whoever's living with him, whatever family he's using to play test these, the two player games generally turn out very strong. So I'm interested in this. Yeah, this looks downright adorable. I love the 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 cover artwork here, and even the inside pieces are are pretty nice. So not too sure how this plays out, but as you mentioned, you can't doubt Uve, especially when it comes to two player games. All right, next up on the list is the opposite of endangered. This is. <laughs> A game where you're like, why Why are we doing this? <laughs> um, it's called The Cost. It's from Spielworks, Armando Canales. And it's about the asbestos industry. Woohoo! And it's not about the fall of the asbestos industry. It's about uh -oh. being in the asbestos industry <laughs> and trying to make your fortune by mining, refining, and shipping asbestos. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... Look, the, thing. the industry has asked for many, many years. People out there have been asking for many years. When are we getting our asbestos board game? And now we <laughs> finally have it. <laughs> Here's the thing, too, is this is probably going to be like really good as like, a just, <laughs> board game. And I have no interest in playing this at all. <laughs> Do we? <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> and the cover of it is an asbestos i guess breathing mask so no i don't want to put look as you mentioned the mechanics here and and we've discovered this over time we were talking about uh, uh games in the past that did not seem like something we want to play we're actually very good games but in this day and age, please do not release, for your sake, a board game that has a breathing mask on the cover. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants any of that. What are you doing? Oh, oh my it God. Comes with I thought it was a joke. Mask. I thought this was a joke at first. It's like, then I'm reading the description. I'm like, oh, no. It's not even close to a joke. Ugh. Yeah. All right. So moving on to something less toxic, uh, jokey. <laughs> toxic. There you go. Yeah. Um, we have the alpha. So you talked about this a few weeks ago, right? Yep. Yeah, the Alpha game is about a pack of wolves and survival in the wilderness and how you cooperate with other packs of wolves, but also at the same time trying to stay the Alpha so that you get the most food possible. It's a game that was recently released by Bicycle Games or Bicycle Card Games. They released three games, a party game, this kind of tactical game, and an economic game called Exchange, which will also be, I guess, part of the upcoming games this summer. And they're all, you know, mass market games, but they're high quality mass market games and Alpha is no different. All right. Next up on the list is another one about industry and exploitation. Uh, Blue Skies. <laughs> so this is about the 1970s when the U.S. government deregulated the uh, airline industry and a whole bunch of companies swooped in trying to gobble up as much of the market share as they could. Um, obviously, the game's just about connecting different airports in different cities <laughs> trying to build up your company. But I just think it's funny. There's so many of these games still coming out about just absolutely destroying the economy. <laughs> um, so the designer of this is Joe Hoover, who has, he's done a few games, but his most recent is Caravan, um, mm -hmm. which came out fairly recently from Rio Grande games and with some good buzz, um, nice light game about moving cubes on camels. This one is, it seems to be similar in, 
in that it's a little bit of a short game, pretty direct, not too complicated. Uh, you're just trying to connect these various airports and like, it's essentially an area majority game at the end of the day. You want to have the most airports, but also the ones that are going to connect the best to score the most points. So I generally like this kind of game. I'm, I'm joshing a little bit in terms of the uh, the theme, but <laughs> and it's short. It's like 45 minutes, so I'll probably check it out. But I just yeah, it's another one. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the problem with these games, and we, we, as we've been talking about a lot of the rail games and the train games in particular, and how they just have that kind of same aesthetic over and over again, this one seems to, again, harken back, I guess, to its original roots. It may actually be very similar at uh, this very plain, dry kind of, as you mentioned, route building, but hand management game. So, yeah, not, not too into this, so to speak, but maybe there's something that I'm missing. All right, next up is Camp Pine Top. This is a really cute looking game um, from Talon Strike Studios and designer Stephen Davies. I think it's his first game. And it's like everything looks like the hand drawn type of maps and stuff you'd have like at camp when you were like 10 years old. Right. Mm -hmm. So the game is about going out and exploring and you're, you are the leader of a group of scouts going into the wilderness and you're trying to level up your scouts to the highest rank possible. Of course, everybody's an animal because that's just how things work these days. (laughs) And, you're going to be collecting different badges along the way, getting new abilities and stuff. And so as somebody who was a scout as a kid, I just I find the idea really fun and kind of cool. Yeah. Um, it looks to be relatively short and light, as one would expect from a, a game that's designed like this. And I don't know a ton about it otherwise, but yeah, it's definitely one I'll keep on my radar. Yeah, I can't believe that. And I'm trying to, you know, rack my memory if there's been a game out there about scouting and upgrading your troop and such. I don't think I actually can remember anything of that you know that thematic quality here and as you mentioned this looks adorable and it obviously allows you to gain special abilities and and really build up a little tableau so yeah this is this probably is going to be a must buy for me i just like the look of it i like the theme of it i was a boy scout myself so yeah this is a pickup all right next on the list is cosmic colonies and guess what i'm seeing in the pictures chris no no Polly, no! <laughs> I love it. Oh, I, I, love it. To, I don't want to build any more puzzles. <laughs> yes, I'll build all the puzzles for you. All right, so this is from Floodgate Games, designer Scott Alms. Floodgate Games has done Sagrada. They uh, did Bosk last year, which was like a great underrated hit. Uh, Legacy Gears of Time, another great one. So this is a game of, of course, building a home in the stars. You're building colonies, space colonies with polyaminos. Yeah. <laughs> so you'd think that the trend would die out, but it's not. You think it's you would hope. <laughs> <laughs> so you're basically just going to be drafting these different pieces, building out your thing. There does appear to be like a card mechanics in here as well. So maybe a little bit of what we saw in like Isle of Cats, where it's not just polyaminos, a little bit of a mix of other mechanics in there. But End of the day, I'm, I'm all for it. I mean, it makes more perfect sense. I mean, we talk about board gaming so much, but we've had a lot of conversations about puzzles and how that's like cousin hobby, so to speak. So, yeah, I can't imagine this slowing down. I mean, Poly almost makes a lot of sense. Tetris was the game of games forever. So, yeah, it's fine. I just I don't want to have to build puzzles, but more power to you, puzzle people. More power to you. <laughs> all right last one on the list is the stygian society this is a game that we saw at gen con like four years ago five years ago <laughs> in its earliest prototype form um, from ape games it is a cube tower and you are trying to climb the tower so the effectively what you're trying to do here is get to the top of the tower with whatever characters you're using it's a dungeon crawl and eliminate enemies along the way up. But you're also dropping cubes into the tower occasionally based on certain skills that come up. So you're going to act based on what drops out the bottom of the cube tower, as often happens in these things. And you really need to think ahead and try to plan and mitigate for whatever might come out. Um, Also, like any cube tower game, trying to remember what is in the tower seems exceptionally important here. The interesting thing about this game, too, is that it's designed by Kevin Wilson. So Kevin Wilson is one of those prolific gamers who he designed the first edition of Game of Thrones board game, Arkham Horror with Richard Lanius, Sid Meier Civilization, Descent. So he's been around. He's done a lot of stuff. I think mm-hmm. some of his more recent games are tend to be on the big box 
you know, thematic game side. This one doesn't seem to be quite in that ballpark, but a little bit of the stuff in there. Um, so yeah, I'm interested to see if this works as well as it seemed like it would when we first saw it. Yeah, this is a long time in coming. And as you mentioned, the pedigree here and ape games typically does a really good job with their games as far as production is concerned. So yeah, if I could play a diceless dungeon crawl game, I would love that. And cube towers happen to be one of my favorite mechanics, you know, whether it's Shogun or Amerigo, I don't think we see enough of those. So yeah, looking forward to this. All right. So that's everything for this week. Until next time, this is Chris. Hey, this is Anthony. And we'll save you a seat at the table. 